do. I worked in banking a little bit and then ultimately landed in healthcare and worked in healthcare for a number of years uh, as a hospital administrator, which I really liked. I always thought I'd go back to school. I was a psych major undergrad. I thought I'd be a psychologist. And then, um, and I hope I don't offend anybody who's like married to a psychologist, but everybody I met seemed a little crazy. And I'm like, I don't know if they're crazy. So they went into it or they got crazy going into it, but I kind of decided I wasn't going to do that. But the, um, you know, I got into healthcare actually to do research, to apply to a PhD program, uh, and ultimately decided I really liked running things and I liked business. And so, um, I ended up being a hospital administrator for about seven years and then applied to business school. And if I knew what people did to get into business school, I never would have applied. I, I wrote my essays to Harvard in one day. I remember it was 13 essays. And, you know, people put project plans together for two years and, you know, do all the things they need to to get into school. I only applied to two schools, applied to Harvard and BU, because I had, had no idea. And I knew we were moving. We were in California then. My husband, uh, who I met, is a doctor. And um, we were moving back to the Boston area. And so those were the schools that I applied to. And so luckily uh, I got into Harvard, which is kind of a fluke. I think they called me a diversity admit. And um, I remember getting there and going, oh my God, you know, first of all, it's a case method and everybody was iBankers or consultants. I didn't even know what consulting was. And there were people who were having their tuition paid for them. I'm like, am I the only person paying? for my tuition here, I'm like an idiot. You know, when you walk in someplace and you realize there's like a whole bunch of stuff you don't know anything about. So huge learning curve for me um, and really an incredible time. And between my first and second year, one of the consulting firms called me and said, would you like to come do an internship? I said, I think you might've called me by mistake because the name of the practice was something different than what I did. They're like, no, no, we meant to call you. I'm like, okay. And so I went and interviewed and ultimately ended up going there. And it was really lucky for me. It was kind of what I call my residency after business school because it really taught me a lot of the skills I needed. And so I just made a few notes um, around the things that I use from a consulting perspective, um, which uh, I'll never forget the first CHRO job I had. I went in, the CEO came to see me that first morning. He walked down into HR and um, he uh, actually, I don't think had ever visited there. The whole HR organization was freaking out that the CEO had walked in there because my predecessor, let's just say, had not been particularly successful in the job. And he spent like five minutes and then left. And my whole, you know, my office didn't have a piece of paper. Nobody came to HR. I'm like, he, I, and I realized he had no idea what he wanted me to do. He just knew it was broken. And I was going to have to figure out how to set the agenda. And that's the big thing on any HR job I've ever had. What you have to do is go around and find out what are the business problems that the organization has. And then you need to articulate the solutions because business leaders actually don't really understand HR or strategic HR unless you educate them. There are very few and far between that have had that experience where they have strategic HR function. So they move to the operational, I need you to hire this, I need you to do that, versus you going out. And so the first skill I would say is that interviewing, going out and really finding out what people need from a business perspective. Not from an HR perspective, what are your business problems? Because you're the one who's gonna bring the HR solutions to whatever their problems are. And it can be, you know, it doesn't have to be in the people realm. I hate it when people speak speak HR to me, you know, they only talk about the people, you know, you interview a candidate for, I don't know, the CFO, whatever. And they're like, I really care about employee engagement. I'm like, I don't give a hoot about that. I know that I want to talk about, you know, your financial background and what the issues are. So um, you have to raise that, that discussion. And so around, there's interviewing, which I learned, you know, and, and there are ways that you can, there's something that you can take qualitative data. It's called a mentions analysis. So if you go and interview a number of people and take those notes, you actually can make it um, quantitative by saying, oh, this issue got mentioned 42 times. That's how you start to prioritize. You can actually literally do a mentions analysis on the different things. So I learned tools that would help me. The other thing which is related to that interviewing is questioning. I'll never forget, I don't know, I had moved to Chicago for a job and uprooted my family. And I was like really struggling with the CEO. I had already two CEOs. He was a new CEO in this role. And 
he was driving me nuts. And like after three months, I'm like, did one of those emails where I'm like, <laughs> you know? and I read it to my husband. He's like, you can't send that. Okay. Thank God for my husband. He stops me from doing things like that. And so I'm like, but I got to talk to him because this is really not going well. And so I, I realized I need to put my consultant hat on and go in. And I went in and talked to him the next day, the CEO. And I said, have you ever worked with a strategic HR function? And he goes, no. And I said, okay. And that was sort of like everybody exhaled. It was just to have that conversation. I said, okay, um, what do you think of HR? And he said, well, I got to tell you, I think it's a weak sister. And I'm like, oh, great. In my head, I'm like, I wish I'd known that before I moved here, but whatever. And um, I said, so what does that mean to you? And so we then got into a conversation about it. And if I had gone in and said, hey, you're doing this, 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 and this wrong, that would have shut down the conversation, but by using that questioning. And then I said to him, and I knew he was a giant baseball fan. And I said, all right, what do you consider a home run in this role? And then he could articulate it. I said, what's a triple, what's a double? And so by putting it in a vernacular, he understood. And from that day forward, we had a great relationship. We worked incredibly well together. He, I was able to teach him a lot about how to engage and raise his game with HR. And ultimately he was the one who recommended me for the HP job, which was really very nice. But so that questioning, I think going in, and even if you know the answer, you lead people through questioning. Sometimes, you know, you call it the illusion of inclusion, right? That they, you're like, we're going to ask you all these things and then here's the answer, but you guys came up with it. So, you know, letting them have the insight is incredibly important. Um, I think another thing that I really loved that I learned in consulting was how to be dropped into an environment um, that I didn't know, quickly assess it and figure out what are the key levers that you need to understand that really make the business go or not go. And that's always something that um, has stood me in good stead. You know, it's interesting because when I got to HP, by the time I had gotten there, and when I got there in 2011, I think we were Fortune 15, $115 billion, 300,000 plus employees, and then another hundred and something contractors. Um, and, you know, six business units, the level of complexity of that business was daunting. But going in and being able to separate, and this is also what good CEOs do, separate the noise from what are the key issues driving that business is critically important. So you need to make sure you can go in, quickly assess the situation and understand the key levers that are driving that business. And that what's just noise and what's critical. And sometimes that takes a couple of years, you know, or longer. And it shifts. So even if you think you understand it, especially in this day and age, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about HP. One of the things I love about HP is it keeps reinventing itself. You know, like it used to be to me, the business cycle was like oh, seven to 10 years. You know, you could like blob along, do a business process, redesign. Then it got to be like five years. It's like three years now, right? It's like this. And COVID just like accelerated that up the wazoo because everything's changed. I think that's going to change a lot of things we held fundamental. Every time there's a recession or some, I mean, we've never have a pandemic. I always say there's a structural reset after those things. Things do not go back to how they were before. If you think they are, that's a mistake. If your business leaders think, oh, you know, and I have a couple of like, oh, you know, after the 1918, you know, pandemic and flu, there was like the roaring 20s and everybody went and bought things. I'm like, yeah, that's not now. Stop thinking it's going to be okay because it's not going to be okay. You know, this is going to drag on for a while. So I think understanding how that's going to impact your business. One of the things that we're doing now is we, we're having a series of calls we call outside in calls. So like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, McKinsey, we've asked them to come. And if they work for your company, this is the time where you get some money back from them after they've been charging you up the wazoo as a consultant. I can say that, but they come in and do an hour overview. It's super helpful to think, you know, how are they thinking? What are they seeing? And it really opens your mind to what, you know, they're all saying this is going to be two years maybe that we get back to, you know, kind of some steady state. Here are the things that will structurally change. So tell your leadership, have those outside in calls because it really will help you be ahead of the curve. But, but back to that really understanding the key levers of the business. The other thing, and you know, is 
I try and look, I'm always interested in everything around me. I read a lot. I, you know, I can, you can ask Jeff, I come in like, oh, with a thing every morning of something I've been thinking about. And I try and synthesize that information into what is this teaching me? You know, what's, this, how's it going to impact us? You know, you know, we're going to need to do reskilling or we're going to need to transform in this way. So, and I also think that CEOs that are good do this. They take, data in their environment, they synthesize it and they come up with the right conclusions. And so I think that's really an important thing to do. Um, developing a logical argument. I was very lucky to learn a particular methodology in how to put an argument and a presentation together for senior executives. And you start, this is counterintuitive and I'm just gonna tell you this when you're writing a presentation, you start with the answer at the beginning and then you communicate and build the logic answers behind it okay if you try and do one of those meandering presentations where you're you know going through the whole thing and the payoff is at the end you're going to lose your audience senior executives don't have time for that and it was kind of lore in our consulting firm that you know um a giant company um had we've done a project for them you know, for a long time and uh, came up with a recommendation. It was on the first page. The CEO listened, got up and left after 10 minutes. Everyone was like, oh my God. And they're like, no, I agree. And he already went and started implementing. That was actually a successful meeting. They didn't need three hours to walk through it because he believed they had done a rigorous job around the logic. So you start with that, you know, I think we need to move into this market. Um, we're going to save this much money, whatever those things are, you kind of your executive summary at the beginning, and then you go, okay, first section, I think we need to move into the, this market and hear all the slides and graphs and discussions about why, and you keep breaking down the argument under each section. And that way people will know where they're going. You often see people write presentations and you're like, where are we in this presentation, right? You feel like you're wandering in the wilderness as they're like, wait, well, how does this relate to that? You've got to give people a framework and a roadmap. So making those logical arguments, they always know where they are, gives people a real sense of security and they can hearken back to different things and then you can have a better discussion around them. Um, and then part of that is, and that's one aspect of it, but communicating effectively at a leadership level, okay? Don't speak HR to business leaders. The, you know, if you use the word competency or any of that other stuff, don't do that. They don't like that, they don't understand it. You gotta speak business back to business. Um, I remember I was actually in a, a session at, um, in Boston early on in my career and Charlie Baker, who I think is the governor now, he was running a healthcare organization then was sitting next to me. It was the only, it was a bunch of HR people and him. And he was looking at like people like, what the hell are they talking about? We were talking about succession planning and nine box and, you know, two steps ahead and all the other, you know, little rules around that. And he's like, you know, cause people are saying, well, I define leadership by somebody who can move two boxes. And he's like, looking at me like, what? And I, and I said, not exactly how you define leadership. He goes, leadership is if you have a team that's going to go through a wall for you then you're a good leader. So like, don't get into jargony, you know, things that we know behind the scenes. Think about um, how you're speaking business back to business. I think it's really important. And then the other piece is rolling this all up into a, a strategy. And so how do you take the things you're doing from people perspective and, and kind of elevate it to a strategy like, you know, our HR organization is going to, you know, uh, create the most compelling, um, you know, uh, company in the industry and deliver outstanding results, whatever it is. And I always say there's an overarching HR strategy, which I actually articulate for the company. And then we have underlying people strategies. So the recruiting strategy that supports that, the, you know, total reward strategy. So in the easiest, easiest way I think of thinking about a strategy is what do you believe? That's what I ask my team to do. Every two to three years, we redo our strategy. And I say, what do we believe about compensation? We believe that we pay at the market and that we, you know, what do we believe about recruiting? We believe that university hiring is our best pipeline, whatever. It helps you get centered around the things that you are putting in place that ultimately becomes your strategy. 
And if you're doing things that you don't believe are the right thing for your company, you know, we say we hire leaders at all levels, you know, whatever those things are, we believe, I think that helps you really articulate your strategy. And it's very um, good to have a strategy, you know, studies show that people that have a clearly articulated strategy around people actually outperform the market. And you can do it at any size, any scale. It's just really important to think through those elements and then how do they fit together? You know, if you have, okay, we're going to go mobile and, you know, 70% of our um, employees are going to be mobile now and you don't have a development strategy that fits with mobility, you're still, still doing in person training, that's actually gonna be a disconnect and you're not gonna be successful. So you have to think of this holistically and how all these things reinforce each other. And then the most important thing is that it really drafts off of the business strategy. And you know, sometimes, and I know this sounds funny, but sometimes there's not a clear business strategy. I worked at one company and they had just done the same thing forever and they never really articulated the business strategy. Their strategy was we make these things and you know, it is what it is. And it had been successful for them, but it was very hard for me to you know, hang my HR strategy off of no strategy. So I had to kind of articulate it. Um, and then I could figure out what the HR strategy is. So you may be in that case. So you may have to do some work with your CEO and your leadership team to really who do we want to be in the market? What do we want to do and get really clear about that? So then you can really make sure your HR strategy is matching that and supporting it. So anyway, those are a few uh, thoughts on consulting skills. Any questions or? I have um, a question. So you talked about really reading and staying, you know, ahead of things and then synthesizing it for your organization. Um, is that just putting it in the lens of how your organization needs to see that future data? Yeah, well, and I love okay. analogies from different industries and stuff. So, you know, one of the things I always used to tell my folks, uh, and now that's not like one thing, but read the Wall Street Journal. And when you read the journal, you know what I always find interesting is like companies that blow up, it's always people stuff, right? I mean, there's always like, um, you know, compensation issues, the CEO wanted too much money or something, or, you know, a culture violation. <clears throat> you know, you look at Uber, you look at Wells Fargo, that was compensation and culture. I mean, people don't blow up that much on other stuff. People, if you read the Wall Street Journal, like most articles are about people <laughs> issues ultimately. And so, um, <clears throat> but I read everything. I just have like, I'm a kind of voracious reader. I love to see different news. And then I think, oh, they did something over here. How does that apply to my business? You know, it may not be my business, but they're doing X, Y, and Z in another industry. And what can I learn from that? Because that's where you get more creative and innovative ideas. Um, <clears throat> you know, customer service things in retail, you know, that could be interesting for us or, you know, whatever it happens to be and see what sort of the analogous situation is in, in your business, you know, and, and what that can mean for you moving forward. And then also you talked about um, have, knowing what the solution is or what the strategy is, and then building your deck or your presentation yeah. to that. Um, and I think, you know, that's the big difference between uh, being consultative versus being a solutions provider. Yeah. Because right? if you're just taking orders, and responding and reacting versus already having that strategy, but you got to be ahead of things in order to, you and have to know your trade so well. It's hard to do that when you're like, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen any, you know, budget increases in HR in a long time, right? We're all like doing everything on a shoestring. And so even big companies, you think we're rich, we're not. And, um, and so it's not like you have a lot of extra time for your people to be sitting around thinking big thoughts, but you do have to pull them away every once in a while so you can um, not just be reactive, but be proactive. Because if you're not looking outside about all the things that are changing, um, then you're going to miss the trends that actually will affect you. Because even if it's something, you know, there's a, um, uh, Jeff, what's it called? Trend spot or whatever that, that, um, like an app you can put on that shows trends around the world. Like yeah, you know, trend watching. 
pen watching. Yeah. That, that actually those things impact, you, you know, the crazy in, in my little local uh, shopping mall, they op open one of those boba guy, you know, those rent, those drinks with the little round things in it. And it has a line out the door. It's like crazy bananas, how people love that, you know, right next to, you know, another bunch of shops that don't have lines out the door. You got to look at those. What, what's the implication of boba guys on, on, you know, your business or